<laughs> okay, you ready to go? Sure, yeah. Okay, awesome. So, uh, hi, how are you? Welcome to our first uh, sort of kind of live stream. Sorry for the last minute change. We had scheduled it to be on the uh, Facebook and now we pivoted to Google. Thanks for flexibility, Sarah. Um, Sarah Gillum, Dr. Sarah Gillum, MD, is um, my one of my co-founders, along with Dr. Albert D. Piero of Moza, and she's our chief product architect. And in this session, it, we called it uh, how to make a fire self X. Fire is what my sons call things that are great and cool and wonderful. So um, this is actually gonna be a series that we'll do step by step. This first one will be just about the basics of really what is a self X? X what is a self-care experiment? And Sarah, as the architect, would you just walk us through how you think about what a self-ex is? Yes, yep, absolutely. So I think of a self-ex in essentially six different parts. So we'll, we'll talk through those six different parts and I'll give you a little bit of an overview of them and then we'll go through each one in a little bit more detail. Um, so first, just thinking of what is a self-experiment? You know, self-care experiments are things that most of us are doing all the time in our daily lives on a regular basis. You know, if we're trying different nutritional approaches or supplements or workout routines or anything else that we're trying to get an outcome that we want, that's essentially a self-care experiment. But most of us don't necessarily take a very organized approach to running those self-care experiments. So we'll try a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but we don't necessarily pull it all together to really figure out what does and doesn't work for us, which means that we're basically just throwing away a bunch of time, money, energy, and not really getting to clarity. So the benefit of a self-experiment as a structured thing is that we can take those things that we're trying plug them into the self-care experiment structure and get to clarity, get really clear answers on exactly what does work for us and just as importantly, what does not work for us in our unique biology so that we can really start putting our energy into the things that do work for us. Um, so let's talk through the six different elements and any questions on that before I dig into the pieces? Okay, fantastic. So six different pieces to a self-care experiment. There are three different pieces for creating the experiment, and then there are essentially three different process elements at the end. So the pieces for creating it, you have a question, you have a formula, and you have a way of measuring. From there, those three things together give us an answer. So we get my answer, from there we have to make my decision, and then really it's about sharing. It's about doing these experiments together with others. So we'll start with the question. The question is uh, really a, a very fun part of this. You can get inspiration from all over for these questions. Anytime somebody tells you about a new thing that they're trying that they really like and you should try also, or you get them from podcasts or articles, you hear all these different things that you get excited about. Any of those things can be the question that is the inspiration for a self-experiment. So. For example, um, my mom has been really into inversions lately. So I am curious whether standing on my head is actually going to help my cognitive function. So that's my question. Will standing on my head every day help my cognitive function? From the question, we then need to get really specific about how, what, what exactly we're gonna do and how we're going to do it. And we can think of this kind of like a prescription or a plan. And in my example of standing on my head and getting very specific, I might think that I'm going to stand on my head for three minutes every morning within 15 minutes of waking, and I'm going to do that for two weeks. Hi, produced by a girl. Um, and typically I want to make sure that there's a reason for that formula. So part of the benefit of the structure of the self-care experiment is that it gives us a moment to pause and say, hmm, am I actually doing something that's going to be worth my investment of time, energy, or money? And I can do that by doing a quick double check. I can look someplace like examine.com or, um, you know, lots of different sources for validating whether my approach is the best way to do it. And so I might look it up and say, okay, you know what, instead of three minutes, I really need to do it for five minutes and I need to do it for four weeks instead of two weeks. So I can, again, make sure that investment is worthwhile and create my very specific formula. Next, we get into measurements. 
So um, one of the patterns I noticed in my time as a clinician, both in myself and others, is that we are, humans are terrible at remembering how they were doing before versus after um, and any inter intervention. So it, in my own experience, you know, I would go into the doctor and say, you know, I came in here a month ago, I did these things, I don't feel any better. And then they'd go, okay, so your headaches are still the same. And I'd go, oh, actually, no, I don't have any headaches. And they'd go, okay, and your elbow pain is still the same. And I'd go, oh, actually, my elbow is totally fine. And they'd go, okay, well, so your nausea is still a problem. I'm like, yes, the nausea is still a problem. But I completely forgot that those other things were a problem. And I saw this over and over and over with patients. So when most of us are doing our self-care experiments in our regular lives, that exact same thing is happening, and we have no idea how we're actually responding. So it's important to measure. So again, in my example of the headstands, um, it might be that I decide to do a couple of different cognitive function tests before I start the experiment, and maybe I want to do those three days in a row to really get a good idea of where I was beforehand, and then I want to do it after that month of doing those headstands. And again, I'll want to do it for maybe three days to, to get an average and compare the before versus after. Pausing there on those first three, any questions about those? Not for me, I'm very clear, but produced by a girl, any questions? Um, no, this is great, thanks guys, I'm enjoying <laughs> this, thank you. Okay. Very good, thank you. Okay, so that takes us out of the three main building blocks of the self-experiment and then gets into what we do with the outputs of that. So when we run our experiment with those three things in place, the result we get is my answer. And that's really a clear answer using my own personal data showing whether or not it worked for me, whether or not that formula worked for me. And once I have that answer, though, once I have that clarity, it's only valuable if I do something with it, if I make a decision. So that brings us to my decision. And with my decision, what you're doing is you're really weighing the benefit that you got from that formula as measured by my your measurements and as uh, reported in my answer versus the investment it takes to run that formula in your life. And again, think of that typically in terms of time, energy, and money. And then we can look at the balance of those and see if we really got enough benefit to justify the amount of investment that formula takes for us. And if it does, then we mark that formula as a keeper. And we put it into our portfolio of true health uh, formulae that do work, that are worth our time, energy, and money. And if that balance just doesn't work out, then we cut it, we get rid of it, and we know that that is not worth our investment. And then last but not least, we have sharing. So self-experiments are really made to be shared. It's really important to do these with others. And there are a few different reasons for this. One, accountability. You know, frequently making these changes and really sticking to them to get to the point of getting a clear answer, that takes energy and having the accountability of others with you in this and them depending on you to get a clear answer and lead them through this or do it with them really makes a big difference. And then sharing them also provides benefit to others. They're able to get to their clear answer also. So everybody benefits together. So to summarize those six key elements, we have the question, the formula, and the measurement, which gives us my answer. We make my decision and we share. And that, that is a self-experiment in a nutshell. Oh, that's really cool. Um, just a quick note here. I'm, I'm calling in from a conference, from a health industry conference. There's some background noise. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, you don't hear the background noise. Okay. Great. So I have a few questions for you and produced by a girl, please join in. Produced by a girl, by the way, is a multi-talented musician and director and product expert who helps, who supports our creators and our team to create very, very effective self-ex. She's one of the resources available to you if you're thinking of making a, a self-ex with us. But Sarah, what, um, obviously, you know, you're, you're a physician, you're a naturopathic physician, but what, what inspired you to just to, to found this company? and to create this product? Yeah, so I think there's two main parts to that. One is just my 
my own love of self-care experimentation. It's something I'm doing in my own life all the time anyways, and I'm constantly trying to talk other people into doing experiments with me. You know, I'll try, try different nutritional approaches or um, different supplements, different breathing exercises or meditations. Um, and, and it's, so much more fun to do them with other people. Yes. There isn't really there isn't really anything out there to organize it and do that. Um, and I would say that my immediate circle doesn't always have the same needs that I do. They don't have the same goals that I do. Right. Right. So, so opening it up to be yeah. able to find other people with the same needs and interests in a much larger pool um, is very exciting to me. And, and I would say the, the accountability part is a huge piece for me because, you know, frequently for things to be effective, you do have, you have to do them regularly, but you also have to do them for quite a while. You know, I'm great at doing things for a few weeks, but lots of things will require 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And to really stick with it for all that time, it's really nice to have an accountability buddy. So that's my personal motivation. And then I would, I would bring it back to um, some of those patterns that I was seeing as a clinician. Um, one, the, the first one that we talked about a little bit under the formula being that we all find, I think that in general we find it and I find it easy to jump into things, but not necessarily do the upfront work to make sure that the investment is worth it. So starting something without really thinking through how long do I need? What's the exact dosage I need? You know, it'll be like, oh, I'm going to start trying vitamin C for this. And, you know, just start popping a thousand milligrams a day when if I paused and actually looked at it for myself, I might realize, oh, shoot, I really need 5,000 milligrams a day for a totally different period of time. Um, so that that structure I think is really important for both myself and again from what I saw in clinic lots of other people and then the other ones on on the measurement as we talked about in measurements humans just are not good at remembering past states you know our experiences are so variable and there's so much information coming into our nervous systems every minute of every day that it's really hard to keep track of the specifics of how we're actually feeling so being able to create that structure for myself and others so that we we really do have clarity on our experience and understand what works for us and be able to build on that over time, build that portfolio of things that do work so that we can all continue to progress to feel better and better throughout our lives. No, thank you. That's really, really beautiful. Um, I'm going to just change gears a little bit, but the related question is, you know, as I've discussed Moza and self-care experiments with people, uh, a common question is, am I qualified to, to design a formula and the other things required to do a self-care experiment? How do you think about that? Yeah, I think anybody is qualified to run a self-care experiment because, again, everybody is running them all the time anyway. It's Anytime you buy a new supplement at the store or you go to a new workout class or any of those things, those are all self-care experiments. So if you have a question about what will work for your body, that makes you qualified to run a self-care experiment. When it comes to the details of sorting out a formula, again, whatever you would already be doing, whatever you'd already be trying for yourself, if you're just following the instructions on the back of the bottle, that's, that's a formula that totally counts. If you want to, if you have an interest in going deeper and like I said, going to places like examine.com or you know, doing any kind of literature searches or getting help from us at Moza to really validate the, the dosage, the duration, that type of thing, that's, that's awesome. That's a fantastic extra layer, but you don't necessarily have to do that. Anything that you would be doing anyways that um, you know, is safe and standard, awesome, totally qualified. And maybe just to put a finer point in the last uh, the last few sentences that you posed there, a follow-on common question I hear, particularly from my colleagues, you know, is that are in the profession, they'll say, well, this is safe mm -hmm. for people self-care experiments. How do you how do you respond to that? 
Yeah, so I think that that question comes, tends to come from a place um, where we think of experiments more in terms of um, like pharmaceutical trial experiments and surgical trial experiments and experiments that have a much higher risk profile where you do need to have medical oversight and you need to have the IRB and you need to have all these controls in place to make sure that people are safe. That's not what self-care experiments are. Self-care experiments are really, again, the experiments that we're all running every day in our normal lives anyways. Um, so, you know, I would, I would say that if anything, it's less dangerous than what's going on in um, the world at large because there, there is the opportunity to pause and do a double check on the formulations and whatnot. Also, Moza is building in um, ways for crowdsourcing to double check safety and efficacy on the formula that are being proposed so people can essentially vote on the efficacy and safety. Um, so you're not alone. You're not just in in a you know mega store with all the vitamins, pulling something off the shelf and doing it on your own. And then also building in ways for people to actually speak with experts if they have specific medical conditions that um, there might be contraindications with a particular self-care approach, um, giving them immediate access to experts who can provide a double check for them. You know, we're going to try to keep these to something in the range of you know 20 minutes or so. So it's uh, we have a few minutes to go. And I want to now um, elevate back up to a topic that I've heard you talk about a lot, which is the shift, um, the big shift coming from how we think about the relative roles of self-care versus conventional. Mm -hmm. and, I'd love and, to pop in there. Finish. Yes, please. I think you guys said some words that all of our creators are are really intrigued in, and that's the, just popping up and taking a supplement off the shelf and trying it and seeing if it works. And a lot of times um, in our industries um, of sports or music or the arts or acting, we're always looking for ways to enhance our mental, emotional, physical um wellness and we'll go we'll pass around different things that work for our friends like things to help a performer's voice we'll find a supplement and we'll pass it on to them and say try this um, but what i really love about moza and what um, the doctors are talking about for anybody listening is that they really are taking those supplements that we find that we can get over the shelf that has low risk in our mind because we can buy it without prescription but they're giving us a tool and the framework to plug in with really brilliant doctors who are caring about our progress, trying these different techniques and supplements and exercises and saying, hey, here, practice in this space with us, see if it works for you. And we're gonna document it, we're gonna study it with you, we're gonna be here with you all along the way. And that is just, that it, it's such a lifeline for us as we're all traveling and going to different events and have different things in our lives that require wellness at different levels. And so thank you from the bottom of my heart and my creator's hearts that I work with. We really, really are so passionate about um, diving in and learning um, from you both with what you've created with Moza. So I love to stay behind the scenes, as you guys know. <laughs> I'm here to plug in with the creatives when they need director help and I'll be on set and yeah, enjoy. Thanks, Dave, thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much for the wonderful. Sarah, I'm going to flip back to you on that, on the, on the on the issue of would you care to speak to? I've heard you speak to our team quite a bit about the shift. I think it's the time you've framed it. And I'd love to maybe just hear as we kind of wrap up, maybe you could kind of elevate us back up then to the idea of the coming shift that you foresee from your particular and very, I think, a unique vantage point. Yeah, do you wanna, do you wanna narrow that question down a little bit more? I think that we've-, we've Sure, sure. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think that, uh, um, you know, speaking for myself as an allopathic physician, uh, you know, we're trained to think that, you know, that 
that personal health starts with the physician, frankly. We have a self-centric view of the world, that's why we were trained. We think that health begins really with primary care, right? And the thesis, I, I believe, of, of Moza is that um, if we're gonna take care of people um, uh, and take care of ourselves, if we're gonna really fundamentally improve human health, um, while there's a very obviously an important role for professional services, Mm -hmm. That role has to be shifted, I think, up further up the pyramid, and mm -hmm. that we have to see a more profound and just culturally accepted expansion of the importance of, of self-care and the role of peers. And I think you've and our team have sort of been, I think, a, a chief, I think, driver of that thought process and of that philosophy. And I think coming from that naturopathic background, I think you particularly, I think, that's that's very core to you and to your life mission. So. I just wanted to have a chance to hear, hear you again speak to us about about that shift and shift in power, shift in culture, shift mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yes. So let's let's look at um, a couple of different ways in which things are shifting at this point. Um, one would be around how the types of care, and then the other would be around who gets to deliver care. Um, so in terms of types of care, you know, if we think of the, the standard medical model that is out there thinking about, you know, insurance companies and what they cover and what's available, what's trained in medical schools, that type of thing. Um, you know, we, we probably think of things like hospitals and procedures and, uh, pharmaceutical medications and, um, you know, check-ins with the doctor as taking up the majority of the, the healthcare pie. And there's more and more energy, I think, um, just in the the broader community and population towards changing that, the layout of that pie so that there's more and more in the way of preventive care, lifestyle care, um, again, in those areas of nutrition and movement and um, mindfulness, meditation, emotional self-care, those types of things just kind of starting to to shift the distribution of that pie. So there's more and more on the the taking good care of your body so that you don't necessarily need to get to the point where there's a huge need for surgeries and heavy duty duty pharmaceuticals and whatnot on as as large of a scale. So that's that's one shift that I think all of us are seeing and experiencing. And then if we think about how that shift might map to who gets to provide care, um, you know, that model where it is all about heavy duty, hard hitting um, medical management in that model, the people who get to provide care um, are doctors and nurses and um, PAs and NPs and you know, licensed medical professionals. And that, that's great because they're dealing with really complicated things. But as the type of care shifts and we move more and more into optimization and prevention, the people who get to provide that care also begins to shift. And we start to, to see um, a lot more value in the wisdom of the broader community and um, a lot more access to um, or benefit need demand for people like healthcare coaches and then getting down to peer-to-peer -peer support for self-care and wellness and that that's where we really start to get to a big shift where we're shifting from dependence on you know i'm gonna say doctor to cover the the broader group over to peer-to-peer -peer where you know we, we can even see this happening on places like TikTok right now where you have tons of people trying different things, sharing what works for them, other people picking it up, trying it, sharing, picking up, trying it, sharing. And you start to see what things are working, what things aren't working for people. So that, that model, I would say, is also kind of in that vein of try something, but don't really have it in an organized way to see what truly does and doesn't work on a larger scale. Um, so Moza takes that type of thing and again, gives it structure so that we can all get, all get to clarity together. So that that ability to measure and get to clarity plus the the shift towards peer-to-peer -to -peer empowerment and the individual really driving 
their own um, optimization and preventive well-being uh, is, is the second big shift. And Dave, maybe I went over a lot of different pieces there. Maybe you can sum that up in a, a nice sound bite for us. Well, I think you did it beautifully. I mean, I think the take home that you framed in the very top and came back to at the end is that that you you see two big shifts, shifts in the what's and shifts in the who's. I mean, where the what's are the types of cure and the culturally perceived importance and role of um, of self care versus the traditional conventional care, and then two, who's the provider of that and the and you're and you're predicting and foreseeing a rising and culturally accepted primacy of of peers caring for each other. I, I think that's I mean, that's to me is a top line news that you've shared with us, and you've led our team to since the beginning. Um, so thanks. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna move towards wrapping. I just want to ask you then one final thing. We're gonna be here every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Um, talking about this emerging movement that we're helping to catalyze the support. And um, I don't want to say lead because, you know, I don't think I don't think enterprises lead movements. They're cultural, and they come from they come from down underneath in the soul of a society. But I think we can help support it or help catalyze it. Um, I don't think that we ultimately lead it. Um, I think we're part of it. Um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer movement. Um, it's an important shift in power and, and, and shift in, in in culture. But Sarah, as we go through every single week. Today you outlined the six kind of the six elements of self X as you architected it for our organization. I, I think that next week what we'd like to do is then take to at least go deep, at least in the, the first step, maybe the first two. And maybe you come back and then walk us through with an example. Maybe we actually kind of get into an actual self X. Maybe we kind of show some things and we kind of go 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 deep in one or two. Does that sound good good for you next week? Yep, absolutely. That sounds great. Okay. Let's do that. Produced by a girl. Lovely to have you here. Please, please join us. Um, I really appreciate, again, all you've done to help us found this organization. So um, great to see you guys, and we'll see you same time, same place next week. Sounds Thank good. You. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.